The goal of uh, our talk today, and thank you again for participating, what I'd like us to have is a conversation on Afrofuturism, Black aesthetics, and the endurance of counter histories. And because both of your biographies are so robust, I want to start by simply saying that, my goodness, you've moved, both of you have moved from PhDs at Yale in African American studies and in different fields as well, whether it's in political science and English. And then you made, uh, made the decision to move. And much of your biography is what, what I would like you to talk about rather than me telling it, because it leads us to how we get to Lovecraft Country because both of you have done some amazing creative work. And so with that, uh, my first question would be, hold on. Oh, my apologies. What made you decide to leave from academia? I can jump in here and start. Um, it's so great to see you again, Chris. Um, Thank you. Our, our, <laughs> so our great time, to see you as well. Our time at Yale was um, memorable. Um, Bush era. Yeah, the Bush era, a lot of protests and Katrina thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very interesting uh, sort of um, having this conversation with you today and sort of you know, sort of living in a time and a moment historically where people are revising, again, revisionist history as we're sort of considering Trump to be the worst sort of president in the United States. And I recall the tone and tenure to be the same um, during that administration, if we recall. Um, uh -huh. So just a bit about my background. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. Um, my family um, is, um, you know, have, have been entrenched in the Hollywood industry for quite some time. Um, my grandmother's Marla Gibbs from um, the Jeffersons in 227. My mother, who's a, an actress, a producer and director, she started a theater company. It was the only black theater company on 82nd in Vermont, which is located in South Central LA. After her days at Howard University, um, she was told that poor black people did not want theater. And in fact, um, when she uh, discovered Christine Houston as a playwright and produced 227 as a play, that then went on to become a starring vehicle for my grandmother through my mm -hmm. genius. Um, and so I grew up on the Paramount lot, um, grew up very early on as, a, as an actress, um, my early aspirations was to acquire an Oscar. Um, but the more and more I worked, the more I grew bored with the, the sort of mechanics of acting um, and um, started to write. I wrote my first spec script when I was uh, a preteen and it was a uh, who's the boss spec script. And um, mm -hmm. I remember giving it to adults in our circle who read it. And because of how young I was, I was told stick to acting. Great attempt. Um, it didn't stop me from, you know, sort of still exploring my, uh, my sort of creative urges to write. I had, I still have a treasure trove of diaries and short stories and et cetera. But I actually did sort of turn my back on Hollywood because I wasn't being fed in a way in which uh -huh. was necessary. Um, pursue the academic route where at Yale, Jay and I um, met. And um, I would say that it was throughout our matriculation at Yale where activism, as you recall, Chris, there was a hotbed of activism on campus. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and perhaps Jay and I were the leaders of said- Union, oh, union, union. union. <laughs> um, and our academic work. And um, we then, um, when we started a theater company, we went backpacking together in Europe 
in Italy to be specific. And I think it was in Sardinia where the birth of our partnership began. And um, after we returned to the States, when we returned to the States, we started a theater company and um, we produced each other's work and directed each other's plays. And then we went out to the community of New Haven. I mean, if you recall, Chris, there was a very much of a divide between uh -huh. the predominantly black and Latino community that surrounded Yale and the Yale yes. community. And so we were hoping that through our theater company, Adam, even Steve, that we would be able to bridge that divide. Um, and from there, I mean, I'll let Jay pick up from there, but I mean, the story about how we landed here is simply, I would say it's an intersection of our academic work, our activism, and our need, our need at the time to be creative beyond just the academic research that we were um, sort of um, diving in and excavating. So jumping back, I'm uh, from Ohio. I uh, grew up in a small farm town where they shot Shawshank Redemption. And uh, we didn't have a lot to do except play with toys, play outside and watch TV. And so I was always a fan of television, uh, a fan of putting on puppet shows for my family, fan of, um, you know, my older sister and I used to play with our toys. And we had a town in Florida that we called uh, People Land, Florida. And so we had the Barbie family, we had the Fisher Price family, we had the Star Wars family, everyone had a different family. And over the course of, we stopped when I was like 12, right before her 16th birthday. So the course of the first 12 years of my life, uh, we would always play with the people and always be picking up where we left off. So we left off where this happened and this is gonna happen. So weddings, funerals, divorces, marriages, going to school, going to church, you know, fights about who's the choir director, who's gonna get the solo, who's gonna be the beauty queen, you know, all that stuff. Um, and so, but art was always seen as a complement to uh, life and education. And so I never really seriously considered a life as an artist. I was jazz trained on trumpet, classically trained on piano, but that was something that I would do as I went on to become a cardiologist or a lawyer, or in this case, you know, English professor uh, who teaches Africana studies. Um, so fast forward. I went to University of Michigan for undergrad, uh, then I ended up at Yale for grad school and uh, met Sonia. And as she said, um, getting to the Italy of it all, we got back from Italy, we formed a theater nonprofit. And for us, it was really about, you know, we had various incarnations of activism, meeting with our scholarship, you know, and with our artistic expressions. And we decided to shoot a documentary. And so we took a year off in 2003 and we followed 10 nonprofits uh, with the support of Yale's film department. They gave us these fancy new digital cameras that just come out, you know, Canon X01s, et cetera, et cetera. And we followed uh, Rock the Vote, Punk Voter, Hip Hop Political Convention, New Voters Project, Stonewall Democrats, College Republicans, College Democrats, and a few other organizations. And just really getting the pulse. You know, Sonia said at the beginning about uh, W's reign you know, we're on tour with Punk Voter where Fat Mike's talking about, I didn't vote in Florida in 2000. And maybe if I voted, we wouldn't be in Iraq and we wouldn't have gone to Afghanistan. And we wouldn't be in this sort of perpetual era of perpetual war, right? With people that had nothing to do with 9-11, even if you look at the 9-11 report, you know, all conspiracies aside, because I'm a conspiracy uh -huh. theorist. All conspiracies aside, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan were not behind 9-11. So uh, it was exciting for us to be out there and to express our creative muscles, you know, and to sort of see, you know, when you're reading these books all the time, uh, for me, I saw a balance before I came to grad school because I didn't want to go to grad school. So I was like, mm, I was a Marxist in undergrad. I remember going to a lecture by this renowned Marxist from Duke, you know, and they're giving a lecture. And I look outside and I see a homeless man walking through the Diagon University of Michigan. After the lecture, the professor got in their bins, you know, they had rented when they came to Ann Arbor and they drove off. And I was like, there's something amiss here because I feel like people are still perpetuating the same sort of spheres of power that they're critiquing, right? And then I saw Robin Kelly uh, give a talk on uh, being a union organizer, but also being a professor. And I was like, okay, maybe it's possible. Fast forward to Yale. And again, similar tension. It's like, you're reading all day, you're reading this depressing material, you're reading about social inequality. And then you're like, okay, so yes, my contribution may be my discourse. It may be my publications, right? 
But for me, I think for Sonia, it was what else can we do that's getting underneath this, right? And also this creative itch that's, you know, that we need to scratch. And so coming out of the documentary, um, we wrote our first pilot. We got to LA, we we're trying to produce a documentary because Carrie lost, we lost funding for it. So we ended up donating the footage, right? over 300 hours of footage we donated to UCLA, the Bunch Center. And uh, we were like, let's just go for it, you know? And we set out to write TV. Our first pilot was uh, about a reporter post 9-11 taking on a quote unquote Fox News um, organization that she used to work for. Uh, our second pilot was about veterans returning from Iraq with a wartime secret. Uh, this is before you know, army wives and you know people were talking about it. So when we, we wrote it, people were like, you're not supposed to talk about the war. No one wants to hear about that. You know? But we were passionate about voices of the marginal, voices that weren't being heard. Right, voices that are, are counter hegemonic or contradictory or get in that in between space that makes you feel uncomfortable. So in 2009, we um, ended up getting into the Warner Brothers workshop and we got staffed the following year. And uh, we've been staffed ever since for the last 10 years. Uh, for us, the big shift in our career happened around 2012, 2013. Uh, we were, um, had a couple staffing jobs. First staffing job was amazing, it was excellent, it was awesome. Second staffing job was not as great uh you know for whatever reason you know power spheres of power you know and we're like we thought we left this behind but you know when you get to a new space you realize power replicates itself you know so as Sonya is, is known for saying uh Hollywood writers rooms are wider and more male than Congress right and you can see this even in TV right you know we're in a quote-unquote renaissance right now but you know Kerry Washington with Scandal was kind of the first black lead of a drama in modern history right black woman lead of a drama right in modern TV history that's what, that, and 15, that white 14 years suit, ago. Yeah. And, that white, oh, and that white suit that rolled in with Kamala. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> it, it's, it's so recent. It's so recent, you know. So for us, we wanted to write uh, our passion and write to what our ideals were because we always try to infuse our academic backgrounds into our writing. And we wrote a neo-Nazi pilot called The Fourth Reich, which we sold to Showtime. Uh, at the time, uh, people were sort of saying it wasn't realistic because President Obama was in office and they were like, racism isn't around anymore and it's dead and this is surreal and it's not set in the South. Is this science Yeah, science? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, set, it's not set in the South with Confederate flags and no one's sleeping with their cousin and none of the stereotypes that make people feel good about themselves. You know, it's basically in the land of the free and the home of the quote unquote brave, if you have white skin but not white privilege, what do you do psychologically, right? You go out and you form a gang, you become a white nationalist, basically. And so we kind of predicted Tea Party, we kind of predicted, uh, you know, the current administration they were under and all the MAGA beauty that it, it inspires. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it speaks to Sonia and I's desire to always tell stories that are reaching for those crevices, you know, and we felt that uh, Lovecraft Country was a perfect opportunity to do exactly that. And so... Um... Uh, my next question might be arbitrary uh, only because uh, as I began, uh, there's been interesting kind of discussions and uh, the emergence of engaging with speculative fiction, uh, but also what we would call, well, or what we're now calling Afrofuturism. And so both of you, uh, Bless her, Alondra Nelson, who was like one of the first at Yale in particular that was like mobilizing like this notion of Afrofuturism. Or she framed it in a different way where it was around race and technology, et cetera. But uh, I'm interested in, in terms of now that you are creatives, but still not yet, uh, not yet divided from the knowledge that you've gained from your degrees. What does Afrofuturism mean for you? Is it an intellectual project? Is it a creative project? Because and I, and it doesn't, it's not a yes or no answer. It's more of a kind of, because I've always thought that literature is the best theory ever. And so when I posed that question to you uh, before we went online, 
uh, I'm thinking about Octavia Butler, where literature and the creative process, the working through is a theory or it's a practice of it or a praxis of it. And we're starting to see this embrace of something called Afrofuturism that is both praxis and also is now being claimed within certain black study circles as a new kind of theoretical model. And I'm curious because you both of you are in a position to speak to that, what your yes. responses might be. Um, I'll go first. I feel like for me, I have a very specific understanding of Afrofuturism. I think partly because uh, music music is a huge part of my background. And I was a huge like Parliament Funkadelic, uh, Sun Ra, Bootsy Collins fan growing up. And so when I think of Afrofuturism, I think of Space as a Place, I think of Sun Ra, I think of John Sway teaching his class at Yale. I think of music as the sublime, as a sort of like, you know, um, all the possibilities that you can sort of find. What I found in terms of creative versus the academic background and, and you know, theory, I feel like it's it goes beyond literature for me. You know, I would say, you know, literature is great, but, you know, Sonia has a PhD in, you know, two in African-American studies, political science. I also feel like political science, you know, married to Africana studies is also Afrofuturism because in my mind, since 1619, the, the project of the black experience has always been to project ourselves into the future, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, it is space is the place. Yes, it is UFOs. Yes, it is technology, but really it's, I'm envisioning, you know, we say we're the land, we're the, the hope and the dream of the slave or the enslaved, right? Like my great grandmother held me, you know, six months before she passed, right? I was born in October, she died in March. I was her dream, made flesh, right? That's where that line in, in episode nine of Lovecraft comes from when, you know, when Lady's talking to Tick's great grandmother, she's like, this is my hope and faith made manifest. So I feel like Afrofuturism is really about our ability to project ourselves into a future that's without segregation, that's without, you know, uh, Jim Crow, you know, abuses, that is without lynch parties, that's without sharecropping, you know, and that can come in the form of literature, right? So like Octavia Butler, right, who's writing, or Samuel Delaney, right? Or that could come in, you know, writing some public policy, right? That people think is like, oh, this is too ahead of its time. We can't do this, you know? Ways of understanding our relationship to uh, a terrorist organization, you know, historically, like the police, right? That if we go from slave catcher to policing our bodies in public space to this day, right? If you're a political scientist or you're a sociologist, you know, I remember we were at Yale, we talked about, there should be sociologists talking about why do people shoot black people so fast, right? Uh -huh. What is that? Is that biological? If it is, it's depressing. Is it culturally ingrained? How do we fix it, right? Who's going to have those conversations? To me, that is a part of the Afrofuturist project because the conceit of it to me is how do we survive, right? Because it seems like we're always being compressed in the diaspora, always being, you know, uh, today is... Um, I forget the actual term, but it's like, uh, it's basically like, you know, the celebrate black history day in Brazil. Right. And there's an Afro Brazilian man who's beaten to death in a grocery store today. I think by the police, I haven't looked closely at the article cause it's again, depressing, but we're always being smushed and smashed and squeezed and pulled Down and, pulled and tossed. Yes. Right. And so for me, that's why Afrofuturism is so interesting because you know, going back to Du Bois, going back to, you know, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, like, you know, like Sojourner Truth, like, June Jordan, we're all having similar conversations about that which is out there. Is it on Mars or is it here right now? You know, is it Ghana, right? Is it Salvador, you know? Is it, you know, Toronto? Like it, so I, I think that that's where I, you know. And so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, again, in terms of Lovecraft. No, it's, it's, no um, it totally okay. does. Okay. I, I mean, it's such a great question but it's also so layered, right? Because as Jay was sort of extrapolating, I was considering the notion, and I think I did this when we were at Yale, 
as to how we ourselves are the aliens in that context, right? The sort of idea that one has landed in a, in a space where their bodies are both a commodity and both feared, both hated and celebrated. And, and the, the sort of idea of how that then sort of creates a world where, right, the dominant gaze is constructed through your existence, even though it is not yet recognized. And so the African-American experience and the need through Afrofuturism to imagine a world where African bodies and histories and culture and language are center, it's a very difficult question to answer because again, in that I would say Afrofuturism, people could in fact argue was born in the bottom of the slave ship mm -hmm. where, where modernity itself sort of arises, right? Where the experience of people of Afri African descent at the bottom of that slave ship does become the center of the world, does become the center of the narrative although the dominant historical retelling of history attempts to erase, right, the erasure of that experience. And so the need to sort of, as Jay and I have always done in our academic work and our activism, and I would even say in our own personal lives, is not necessarily, it is upending the dominant narrative, but it within itself is we're resetting it, right? And so, mm -hmm. You know, Jay and I, we always, we, we always talk about how, again, when you look at the very experience of enslaved people, I, I, it is very hard. I think it's a very difficult question to answer because again, at the core of it, I, we are always alien in my mind when I'm writing. So it is a lived experience for me. I would also say growing up um, in a household where um, everyone has an African name, right? My, give, my African given name is Naila. The need to reclaim history, the desire to have and always be surrounded by African art and artists. I was embodying an Afrofuturistic experience in my mm -hmm. sort of evolution as a, as, a, as, a, as a Black woman, as a woman of African descent and other descents that I choose not to recognize. It is a choice. Um, So I would think that it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's in my personal life, but I think that in, the, in, our, in our creative endeavors that even when we're having a conversation about neo-Nazism, that at the core and the center of that, we place black bodies, right, Jay? The idea that, um, the, the, the idea that one that could be white, one that doesn't embody the, all of the American experience itself is juxtaposed with, um, with the, the sort of the marginalization and advanced marginalization that is happening within um, black communities and how they're, mim they're mimicking that sort of behavior, this need to identify through family, through gang, through an identity that is being given to you by your chosen family. Um, I would also say feminism itself, because Jay and I write from a feminist and um, anti-heteronormative perspective that that also sort of informs the ways in which we sort of tackle art. And again, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'm trying to get oh, there. You is, totally are. Which is the <laughs> idea that- This is a conversation. Are, we, are the, we are the embodiment of this, this sort of typology, this ideology that Alondra Nelson, but again, what predates her is Octavia and um, Sam and, but again, I mean, Malcolm, right? Um, Martin Delaney, King, uh, Kathleen Cleaver. I just, so I guess for me, it's a very, it's a, it, you know why I'm struggling to answer it? Because if you've been living it, it's very hard to separate yourself and to look outside of it looking in if you've been living the experience. And I think even on shows where at the core, there was there were, there might have been a desire to move away from it. It's always been at the center of every 
every piece of art that Jay and I have ever created, even if that's on a procedural. Um, so I would say that it, it is a sort of, again, a sort of perfect sort of combination or collision of all of those sort of spheres that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And some, uh, because I, all, I also want us to like do kind of like a bit of a deep dive into some themes that come up in Lovecraft Country. But one of my questions uh, was, uh, Lovecraft Country success coincides with also this kind of groundswell of other black creatives that are now entering the scene in very interesting ways. And the first one that pops up in my mind because I'm just a fan, Mika uh, Michaela Cole's like, I May Destroy You. And thinking about the ways in which when given and I, even as I frame this question, I'm concerned because it's like when given license to tell our own stories, what can we see? And like, I may destroy you if not also love, like Lovecraft Country as well. I'm just like, oh my God, there's a whole other visual landscape. And I'm wondering how both of you engage with this like moment do you understand it as like a spontaneous moment that's going to be short term or as part of a longer project it's, of changing the system listen i grew up at a time where the jeffersons was the number one show on television you know um and that wasn't the only black show. There was, um, you know. Good times. There was good times. There was different strokes. There was Webster. There was, um, you know, Robert Guillaume show where he was the, I can't remember, it was the spinoff. Benson. Thank Benson. You. And so, <laughs> you know. Call yes, him by he, his name. He was yes. Benson. <laughs> right, Benson. Um, we had um, Sanford and Son, right? And then we went, I would say, you know, that was sort of the gift out of all of that, the sort of groundswell of activism in the 60s and 70s. And then I went off to college and television became extraordinarily and strikingly and shockingly white. Um, there weren't even black sitcoms on television. I mean, you know, when Martin and Living Color and living single, when they went away, it was like there was a, a dearth. There was a time when there was no black content or content where it just showed people of color uh, at the, you know, as a starring, as a star, right? As the principal actor, right? I mean, it was easy to turn on a show and we're the sidekick or we're the smart, sassy best friend, or, you know, we're just there as, 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 um, as an accessory. And so I think we exist in a time right now where, again, Hollywood is a, we can't forget it. It is still centered within capitalism um, and which is driven by money. Now, the critique against that is, well, if Sonya, if that's the case, then where, where was the black content in that time in which it disappeared and what you're talking about? Because black people actually do support one another's projects. And I'm talking about the consumers, right? They go to the movies. Mm -hmm. It, black films make the money back, right? Um, black people watched Martin, watched In Living Color, made these shows number one, in addition to those outside of the community who watched. So what happened? Isn't it white supremacy? What happened to those programmings? Why weren't African-American creators given the same opportunities as white creators to make a, a again, living, many people argue that living single is the black version of Friends. And there has been no credit given. Um, I don't necessarily mm -hmm. know if I sit there. I think um, um, Marty Kaufman has said that that was about her experience growing up. But even watching that show, you mean you, you can't even find background of color? Mm -hmm. That's just purposeful. That is, in, that is intentional. And she has since apologized. 
Um, but that's only because we're at a time where everybody's having this conversation. And so I think that um, Lovecraft Country, listen, let's talk about shows that predate Lovecraft Country. Um, Luke Cage was a huge success. Um, massive. Uh -huh. Remember, it broke Netflix. We were all signing on breaking our neck. The, 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 the tagline was, what is this, America ready for a, a bulletproof black man? <laughs> Genius. Uh -huh. um, there was um, a move at the time, there was a transition before Lovecraft where black comedies had come back. We never give Mar Brock Akil the credit that she deserves. The woman has been working tirelessly and effortlessly since Girlfriends, The Game, right? Being Mary Jane. Now her husband is doing Black Lightning and she just signed a, a massive deal at Netflix, but she was still doing the work. Uh, the panvasses of the world. Everybody was still here. They were just waiting for their opportunity, but there was black content that started to sort of bubble up. And Jay and I remembered the shift because it became, it was the shift from, well, just give us a great procedural to you have anything in your coffers around black people? And we were like, yes, it's back. And that was because of the success of Luke Cage and others, again, paving the way. Chao um, is the, was the creator of Luke Cage. Charles Murray, Kayla Cooper, all these are great, amazing black artists that worked on that are now off all working on their respective projects. I would say just to sum up, cause I'm sure Jay wants to jump in here, that I don't think this is just a moment. I think that because uh -huh. we have 500 shows on the air that every network is realizing, well, what do, we, what do we have that is special on our roster? What gets us to the Emmys? What gets the black consumers? By the way, black consumers, what, spend a billion dollars every year? I mean, that is a consumer base that one cannot ignore. And so I don't think that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a moment. I think that it's a punctuated moment that is gonna be here for a while because I think at a certain point, how many different ways are you gonna tell a story about whiteness that is not that interesting anymore? Whiteness itself becomes interesting when it is introduced to other cultures of, you know what I mean, of other experiences, mm -hmm. but not the ways in which that they've constructed it. And, I, and so I think that it's here to stay. Um, that is my optimistic and hopeful perspective. Um, I guess ask me in five years. And I would say, I agree. I think that, you know, to me, I think it's, it's about money. As Sonia said, it's financial. And when you have, you know, the, to me, one of the greatest things that ever happened was, you know, getting rid of the three channels when Fox News came along, not Fox News, but Fox, the network came along. Then you have cable. And then, you know, I don't know if you remember, the game was actually canceled. Um, I think it was CW that canceled the game, right? They were the number one show and they got canceled. Eight million viewers, they're getting canceled. They moved to BET. I distinctly remember it because we were on an ABC show, a cop show, and uh, we premiered the same night as the game and they slaughtered us. And I was like, what? You know, but if, you're, if you have 500 channels and the black show is going to give you a guaranteed 8 million people, that's considered a breakout hit nowadays. Whereas in the past, mm -hmm. you get 18 million, people are like, eh, give us 30. Who shot JR? We had 50. You know, it's not 1981 mm -hmm. anymore. And so I think that also, you know, there's there's too many channels, there's too much content. You know, it's it's jarring now not to see a diverse show. Like, unless it's like period and very specific, like I'm a huge fan of the crown. Okay, I can I can dig and get down with that, right? It looks amazing, it's written great, actors are on fleek. But if it's just a regular show, like I can't watch a regular show where it's just all white people because it because my brain has been deconditioned to experience life through that. And I'm a huge fan of Seinfeld. I love Seinfeld growing up, right? One of my favorite shows of all time. All white, except for the, the tanning bed episode or do you know what I mean? The very special episodes where you saw people or Johnny Cochran showing up. Um, so I think that the consumer and you also have a generation of people that had grew up on hip hop. That's why Empire was such a breakout hit. Because you have black people coming, then you have white people saying, and Latin, Latinx people saying, and First Nation people saying, well, sh I, I rap. Where's, you know what I mean? Like, that's why it was such a fun show to watch. And I can't wait for them to be like, where's it? Where's the spinoff? Because you could put this shit in Japan. They rap in Japan, like, what's up? Do you know what I mean? Like, where's the Japanese mogul coming in to take over the empire? It's, it's Lucius's lost son. He's happy, he's blazing. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there was so much you could do with that show because 
hip hop is a global phenomenon. We keep forgetting that, you know, we, we shrink it to the Americas, but it's like, it's interesting because I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because I feel like in a lot of ways, a lot of hip hop nowadays is about, you know, CISRIP and addiction and it's very depressed for, you know, a lot of the younger generation. But if you Google, you know, uh, breakdancing in France, you see these Algerian brothers and sisters like pop locking this shit like it's 1982. And you're like, what? It's uh -huh. like amazing. You know, it's in Brazil. It's again, it's in Tokyo. It's everywhere. So I feel like because there are so many channels, because HBO Max is global, Netflix is global, Amazon is global, you need shows that are going to spark to those populations. You know, Sonia and I are, we can't wait to have our shows. They're set in Nigeria. They're set in Botswana. They're set in right. Ghana. They're set in Egypt. Because we want to tell those stories for literally our whole careers. You know, like we wanted to do a Tulsa feature in 2005. We're still at Yale. And we're like, okay, we mm -hmm. can maybe get this Tulsa feature done. Da, 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 da. No one's talking about it. People are like, nah, no one wants to hear about Tulsa Massacre. Ah, whatever, right? No one wants to hear about Emmett Till. Ah, whatever. And so, again, what's, another thing that's great about Lovecraft is because the door has been opened, it's an opportunity for us to tell these stories. And people are like, oh my gosh, the Tulsa Massacre is heartbreaking. It's tragic. It's infuriating, right? And again, it's still a conversation starter because it's still relevant. You know, if you look at, you know, I'm not jumping ahead on your questions, but you know, episode three of Lovecraft, uh -huh. when Letty's in the back of the van with Lancaster and they give her a rough ride, right? If you look at the Philly PD, they sold a lawsuit a couple years back for the rough rides they were doing for, you know, on black bodies, right? Freddie Gray was murdered, right? On a rough ride in Baltimore. But episode three airs in the context of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Like we've even, you know, we were writing to the last quote unquote era of black bodies being shot down and killed by the police. And we debuted within another era of black bodies being shot down and, and, and killed by the police or suffocated on camera. So I think that because people are, I think even if people don't have the conversations about being anti-racist, about tearing down systems, I feel like as consumers, capitalism, and the fact there are so many channels and there's so many opportunities will ensure that these stories will continue to be told. And there's so many stories to tell. And so it's in this spirit where, and for clarification, I was giggling because when you brought up Seinfeld, I was thinking about that episode where Elaine was dating like a unidentified, potentially mixed race person. Yes. And it's like, so what, we're just both two white people? Yeah, let's go like, to the like, game. And we're like trying to decide, like, are we in a mixed, like, I can't believe they were treating us like this because we're in a mixed race relationship. I'm just like, but which one of you is mixed race? <laughs> but it was fantastic right. because remember the famous line at the end of the episode is like, well, you're white. Oh, so you're just white. And they were both deflated and just dis disappointed. And they said, want to go to the gap? Yeah. That defining whiteness as, cons as a consumer, it was just, anyway. Yep. Great episode. Yes. And so I want to jump to a different set of questions. And so this might make us move to the side and we're looking at visuals. But one of the things that struck me because one of uh, the questions that I'd uh, present, uh, offered you earlier uh, is that like Lovecraft Journey is like so incredibly genre bending and you know that I'm going to be going in a different direction after this. Hold on. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm syncing everything properly. Da, da, da. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, my apologies to the audience in terms of the potential delay, just making sure. I've got everything in sync. But one of the, uh, well, I'll pose the question and then uh, what I want us to, wanted us to do was to speak to particular kinds of 
scenes that audiences and audiences encounter. And so the question was more specifically around how do you define or how could you define uh, define Lovecraft Country? Because I've heard people like speak of it as a horror show. And my first thoughts, and these are the images that I'm trying to conjure, uh, but my tech abilities, hold on, oh wait. Mm -hmm. Oh, here it's happening. From current slides, skip, skip, skip. It should be sharing, I hope, or hold on, new share. You've got to be kidding. My apologies with the whole tech thing, but no, uh, if, no worries. Uh, as 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 we all know, uh, these are new times. Mm -hmm. I'm still stubborn, so I'm going to try and pull up the images because I. But my and so the image that I was going to conjure was was Ruby mm -hmm. in the first episode where she is performing and what we begin with in Lovecraft Country is Black Joy, as well as what we see is familial tension, but nonetheless it's Black life undisturbed. And so for me, this uh, idea of like, how do we, like, how do we understand Lovecraft as a genre? Is it sci-fi or horror? My next thought was as soon as they do the road trip and they're going into sundown, it's like, but this is already horror. Like I understand it as such. And that was kind of like the jumping off point for me and I'm still, again, stubborn. I'm going to try and pull up the images. I can jump in while you're looking for images. Um, I think that, you know, joy is, uh, again, it's Afrofuturist, right? Because as a coping mechanism, you know, if you are enslaved and you're experiencing all these horrendous things that are happening to you, um, you find ways to survive. You know, so growing up, you know, I was always taught, don't let, you know, oppression steal your joy, right? Because if they steal your joy, then they have everything because they can oppress you economically, they can oppress you physically. But if you read a book, no one can take what you put in your brain out. Even if they kill you, you still have knowledge and knowledge is power, right? In the same sense, joy is also power. Um, I, so I think that, and it goes along with, you know, joy along with apathy, you know, or sort of like what people call apathy, but against a coping mechanism for facing, uh, a matrix that literally grinds our bodies and, you know, uh, you know, commits sexual assault against generations of black women and then says the offspring of those, those assaults and rapes are smarter, more beautiful than the people that came here. It's insane. And so, you know, all that to say, you know, I agree, you know, Lovecraft to me defies genre because black experience defies genre. It's arch. You know, if you pitched what I just mm -hmm. said, Right. A group of enslaved people come over, their tongues are taken, their food's taken. And again, let's remember, these are teachers. These are doctors. These are artisans. These are uh, farmers. These are siblings. These are parents. Right. It's not just a void of like, oh, you just you're you're an enslaved person. You had a fully formed four dimensional, spiritual, emotional, financial life, cultural life that was snatched. Right. You put in the bottom of a ship shipped across the world and then you used to build uh wealth right like that in and of itself is horror that in and of itself is genre you know it plays like a sci-fi film like sonia said we're aliens yeah. like that that is so for me you know when you think about hp lovecraft i don't know if he's, he's gonna come up or not but to me it, it wasn't interesting like him having a cat called nigger man is not interesting right that's a very bargain basement boring white supremacist okay african person or african descent runs into a guy and oh the voodoo spirit jumped into the white man and killed him that is like the birth of sci-fi 
what? So we're already there. Do you know what I mean? Like we're already, white supremacy already put us at the core of sci-fi as the creature, as the other, right? Um, and so really what we were doing with Lovecraft was just illuminating it from a different perspective where we go from, instead of, uh, you know, we're the monsters coming in to kill people, you know, it's kind of like a homage to Night of the Living Dead with Ben, you know, or we're, we're you know, on the lookout for the bigot and the pilot, right? Because the bigot is the true monster. It can come up and kill you at any point. Take your property in episode three, uh, take your job in five, you know, uh, lynch you in eight, uh, you know, destroy your whole life and your family in nine. Um, you know, the bigot represents this sort of archetype, right? That looks at horror through the lens of the black experience, you know? Because again, what is, what is your biggest fear as a black person walking around the diaspora? Is it the police or do you not fear the police? Is it walking into a store? You know, I like to crack the joke. I say, if I walk in a store and you know, they say, hey, sir, can I help you? I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna steal something. They're gonna follow me around, right? If I walk into a store, they don't say anything to me. I'm like, well, my money's not good here. They're ignoring me because I'm black, right? That's a conditioned response from white supremacy. And so, you know, I don't know if that's answering your question, but to me, I oh, feel no, like that, that was no, the beauty of love. No, com completely. Like I'm realizing that, because uh, I just sent you seven questions, but like the first four already provoked answers to certain questions that overlap. I'm interested in, and I'm hoping people can see this, hold on. I'm supposed to be sharing, hold on. Can you see slides on your end? We can. Okay, yes. good. Mm -hmm. But they ain't moving, so I don't know what that's about. Well, well that's okay. Um, I'll just sort of jump in and just say that I think that when you look at the image of Ruby, when you talk about joy, I think Angela Davis said it best. Um, and I think Condoleezza Rice said it as well, which is within segregation, African-American communities were thriving. Children were happy. Families were, you know, either, you know, building and bridging or breaking apart. People were living their lives. And so the need and the campaigns historically to sort of return back to segregation is this sort of idea that when there are no white bodies present, how does one who is black take agency and control over their happiness when is it isn't defined by power or violence or the white gaze as jay was sort of talking about walking through the store and being monitored surveilled um or, or just haunted and so to me that's why the pilot itself was so significant because there was after that right we had small moments where we you know our characters were able to sort of make love and, and laugh, but mostly they were just in terror most of the rest of the show. So it was important to show what does black life look like without interruption, right? Which is a line from episode five. What is Ruby when she's yeah. uninterrupted? Um, and so I would say that, um, that as the elders have once said, and at the end of Dr. King's life, Remember, he contemplated returning back to segregation. We do remember that, right? You know, I love how we only remember uh, uh, Dr. King um, in this sort of stagnant image that's on a on, that's on a stamp. You know, but he's that we need to integrate when, on economic principles, it was like actually black people had survived better. Exactly. When we created our own local economies. And so then yeah. what is it like, what does integration mean in this context? Yeah, exactly. And I think that um, that that is a, that's what's happening in the pilot. Right. Again, before there's an interruption, there's greatness, there's happiness, there's joy um, and there's celebration. So and I would say just re just really quickly, just to wrap up that question, you know, it, Lovecraft Country defy, defies um, the need to narrowly circumscribe it to one category. It isn't just horror, it's sci-fi, it's horror, 
It's a historical uh, uh, roadmap. It's a text, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. It's a family drama. It's a, there's a love story at the heart of it, right? And that, that love story goes beyond Letty and Tick. It is with, mm -hmm. um, you know, Montrose and his son, Tick. You know, it's with Hippolyta and herself and her husband, her love for her daughter. I mean, love is all throughout the show on top of it being an Afrofuturistic sci-fi horror, African-American historical piece. That's how I would define Lovecraft Country. 